Welcome to The Third Story. I'm your host, Leo Sidrin, coming to you from inside my daughter's closet in Brooklyn. Recently, I was home visiting my parents in Madison, Wisconsin, and I interviewed my dad. You may remember that episode from last week. And I recorded the introduction to that episode from inside my old closet. And you know, it sounded pretty good in there. I even got some feedback about it sounding good. So I'm back in Brooklyn now, but I figured why not see what the closet scene is like here? The only thing is that I don't really have a closet in Brooklyn like the one I had growing up, carpeted with a light and actually a little ledge to sit on. It was, turns out, a really great closet. It's like we never really know our closets until we choose to look carefully with a certain amount of attention, without attachment or assumptions. And even then, there are those among us who would ask, can we ever really know someone else, their intentions, what they're thinking? But back to the closet, here inside my daughter's closet uh, is where you find me, and it has neither light nor carpeting, so I'm not sure if I see much of a future in this one. Nonetheless, the search for truth continues. Today's conversation features David Marinus. He's a New York Times bestselling author known for his expertly researched books, including biographies of former presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and legendary sports figures Vince Lombardi and Roberto Clemente. He's also written books about historical moments or events, including the Rome 1960 Olympics, Detroit in 1963, and Vietnam and the war at home in 1967. His new book, A Good American Family, is both a continuation and a departure for him. It tells the story of his own family, and it's framed around an event that happened in 1952 when David's father was called before the now infamous HUAC, House Un-American Activities Committee, and outed as a communist. It's true, his parents, both of his parents, had been members of the Communist Party, as had many of their contemporaries. Those who were called to testify and who didn't name names, who didn't cooperate by naming other communists, were blacklisted. That's exactly what happened to David's father. Although David only has a vague personal memory of it because he was just a boy when it happened. But the book also examines much larger issues around that event, including the ongoing question of what it means to be and who is an American, the influence of extreme ideologies on the 20th century, fascism and communism, and the way mental health and personal tragedy are handled within families. I have to tell you all that because we talk about it in some detail. David is a Madison native, same as me, and although we're from different generations, We actually talked a few days after his 70th birthday. One thing we have in common is that we both return annually, like salmon or turtles, to our home. Actually, David wasn't born in Madison. He ended up there after his father finally found a port in the storm after moving his family from place to place, job to job. Uh, His kids, his older kids, moved from school to school, sometimes multiple times in a single year, and he finally landed in Madison. But That's the place that David considers his home. And even though he lives most of his time in D.C., he goes back to Madison every summer with his wife, Linda, who is another Madison native. Why Washington, D.C., you ask? Well, David's been affiliated with The Washington Post for more than 40 years as an editor and writer and twice won Pulitzer Prizes at the newspaper. So even though David and I spent some time talking about his book, we also talk at length about his general process, his approach, the techniques he uses and the values that inform his work. For example, he says at one point that he believes that in all creative work, magic plays a valuable part. I love that. I mean, this is coming from a journalist. We also talk quite a bit about the role of the fourth estate in America, journalism, the press, traditionally, and how it's being tested in today's political climate. So, like much of David's work, this episode is both timely and timeless. Why he considers himself to be a nonfiction storyteller, what's so great about competitive sports, what happened to the Americans who fought in the Spanish Civil War, can we ever really know what someone else is thinking, the lost art of letter writing and why it's so important to historians, why obsession is so fundamental to his process, how many words a day is a good amount to write, and when is it time to go swimming? It's all here, my friends. As always, visit third-story.com for the archive. Get involved, say hello, subscribe, get hung up, share it on social media. You know this. You know this. Patreon.com slash Third Story Podcast is where you go to make it official. When you support this podcast as a patron, it's like we're going steady. Here's me and David Marinus in the music room at my parents' house in Madison last week. Let's get into it. One, two, one, two. This is David Marinus in the coolest room in Madison. David Marinus in the coolest room in Madison. <laughs> Congratulations on your new book. Thank you, Leo. How would you describe the process of going into a project? Well, for my books, 
the first year and a half to two years is just research. Mm. And then there's a point, I can't describe it, but I know I'm ready to start writing, but not finish researching until the, my last day of writing, actually. And I love both aspects of it. In Madison, I'm usually here during the writing process. This summer, I just finished a book, so I'm not starting writing yet. And I'm, But when I'm writing, my general rule is I don't set a daily quota, but I set a weekly uh. quota because every day I feel a little different. So I try to write, say, what would add up to a thousand words a day for seven days, but not in those each, uh, not a thousand words a day. But and it's a word count, and not a number of hours, or a... it's a word count. There are times when I've written. I wrote one chapter of the Lombardi book in twelve hours, mm-hmm. and it was ten thousand words, and I was just ready for it. I yes. didn't want to stop. It was the ice bowl chapter. I have a few other techniques. I try to often end my work day in the middle of a thought or sentence so I know where I can pick up the next morning. And I love that feeling, and it makes me want to get up and do it, Um, Mm. as opposed to being stuck and quitting. I try to end on a place where I'm moving. Is there a concern that you won't be able to get back there? Is there ever a concern that you, when you're really hot and you walk away from something, when things are really flowing, if you leave it, that you come back the next day, it won't be there? Not as much in writing as there might be in other artistic, because the writing is all dependent on thought and words. Mm-hmm. And if I, never, I don't get writer's block. Yeah. So I'm not worried about that. One of the other things I do at night, if I am all stuck on the long term, is I find that I resolve a lot of issues in my subconscious, in my sleep. And sometimes I wake up and have a, a thought that just propels me for the next week or so. And pen and paper next to the bed? Yep. Those are some of my techniques. I usually write better in the morning and at night than in the day. Uh huh. The hours between noon and four, I'm kind of pathetic. <laughs> so I try to do something else, go swimming or, mm. or uh, read. How did you decide that this was the time to write this book? I knew that I was not going to write this book while my parents were alive, primarily because they didn't talk about this part of their lives, and I wanted to honor them in that way at least, their desire not to be defined by that period of their lives. But more than that, I'd spent a lot of my career writing about writing biographies of people who were strangers to me and became familiar after four years of research. And while I was doing that, I was always thinking, well, you know, all of us hear the mythology of from our parents and grandparents of the family story, and very few of us have biographers coming behind to find the real story. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done that with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and Vince Lombardi and Roberto Clemente, And by the time I was done, I knew more about their families than they ever knew. Mm -hmm. But did I really know the story of my own family? I knew the shadows of it, but not the reality. And I decided it's time. It's time for me both to understand my family, my father, and myself through that story. You put so much research into all of your books, and this book is heavily, heavily researched. I couldn't help but think while I was reading it that because a big part of the theme that runs through the book is about what it means to be American and to be Mm un-American, that it's really of the moment today. There's a secondary sense of meaning that runs through the whole thing that I can't help but read it in the context of what we're going through politically today. You know, that's such an interesting concept because I started the book before Donald Trump rode down the escalator Mm. and entered our lives in such horrible ways. Mm -hmm. But I knew that the question of what it means to be an American cycles through our history Hmm. um, from the very beginning. You know, Native Americans weren't American enough, so they, you know, they were killed, you know, genocide. Uh, African Americans were enslaved. Women weren't allowed to vote. You know, who who is American and who defines it um, was a central question to me throughout a lot of my uh, career. And so this was an opportunity to delve into it in a very personal way, but using the particular to write about something universal. I guess what I'm hearing you say is that that question was already on It was on already mind. on my mind. And then, you know, this happened to me once before. Uh, I wrote a book about Vietnam in the 60s. It came out right when Iraq was happening. Mm-hmm. So all of those questions of 
what what is the role of dissent in American life, soldiers fighting in a place where they didn't know the culture or the language. All of those familiar themes were came into that book as well, but I started it before the Iraq War. Mm-hmm happened again this time. And so, you know, when I'm writing it, I'm I'm thinking about what's going on today. But I'm also careful to not go too far in that direction, because I want my books to hold up for history. Mm -hmm. And when you frame them just from a temporal point of view, they sort of become not passe, but they they lose that universal sensibility that I'm always trying to put into my books. Mm -hmm. There's something extremely granular about what you do, and there's also something extremely global about what you're doing. I mean, you've got these big themes that run through a book like this, and also you're not afraid to go really, really specific for a little while on something. You know, I've often used the metaphor, even though I hate oil drilling, Uh (laughs) of setting up an oil rig somewhere and digging as deeply as I can, trying to tell a larger story through something very specific. Yes. And I find that that's more rewarding for me as a storyteller than to just go over the surface of a long, you know, a a lot of distance. And I think you can get to the same uh, larger themes that way and make the reader feel more attached to the story. Uh Uh-huh. So how do you see what you do? Do you see it as a form of journalism? Do you see it as storytelling? Do you see it as research? What is it? It's all of those things. Uh And I've often tried to describe the best journalism as having all of those elements. It has to have the... You can be a a facile writer and sort of develop a following in nonfiction on the surface, but it's not rewarding. Mm -hmm. Um, The research is what nonfiction has to have. And and all good writers of nonfiction have to be good researchers as well. So I, I love both aspects of that. And I believe deeply in storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I consider myself a nonfiction storyteller. Uh-huh. And so character, geography, history, sociology, um, all of those drive the story. Yes. Through your research, at some point, a story tells itself to you or reveals itself to you, or you have to craft a story out of what you found. You know, that's true, and I don't always know where it's going to take me. I have some friends who are nonfiction writers who I admire greatly, who have outlines that are almost as Mm -hmm. in-depth as their their books. Mm -hmm. I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I know essentially where I want to start, where I want to get to, and for a chapter, I might have one page, you know, mm-hmm. a yellow page of, of sort of the Stations of the Cross. Mm-hmm. But I believe deeply, as musicians do, in the magic of improvisation, of not really knowing until you're there, something unfolds and you said, wow, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see those connections before I started writing it yes. or playing it. So in that sense, I'm always trying to allow... The, that mystical aspect of, of writing to present itself to me. It reminds me of something you say in the book. You say at one point, I don't believe in fate, but I do believe in sometimes that <laughs> circumstances conspire or so, something to that extent that... You know, yeah, it's, it's a... I don't know how to explain that. I mean, I, I don't believe in fate. I don't believe that everything's preordained. But I do think sometimes the world has a magic to it that, that just reveals itself. Yes. You know, I'm not a religious person. I do believe in sort of a spiritual essence of humanity, and I think that's part of it. Sort of the connections of all of us. Yes. and you, But you referred just now to, to a kind of magic that exists through, through writing and through the research of looking into people's I lives. I think all creative arts are in some sense dependent on, on magic. Uh-huh. You generally choose exceptional people or situations to write about? Yeah, mostly. That's true. Um, but I don't choose them because, like for my biographies, yes. in none of those cases did I choose them because they were famous people only. Right. In other words, for Bill Clinton, I saw it as an opportunity to write about my generation mm-hmm. and with Hillary as well, the post-war baby boom generation mm-hmm. and everything that it went through and used the history use their stories as a way to write about that history. Yes. Um, for Vince Lombardi, I'm not going to write about any other coach, um, mm-hmm. but I saw in him an opportunity to write about the mythology of competition and success in American life, mm-hmm. what it takes and what it costs. 
and to use him as that vehicle. For Roberto Clemente, it was the story of essentially migrant workers, you know, coming yes. from from uh, the Caribbean to, to America. And he did it in a phenomenal way where he was able to transcend uh, race and language and succeed in America <clears throat> as the first great Latino baseball player. And for Barack Obama, it was this incredible, you know, how the world created him. So I'm always looking for something more. And using, in those cases, people that, that, that readers know about to illuminate the world around them. In each of those cases, there are a thousand other famous people that I'm not going to write about. Sure. Do you think that if we go deep enough behind anybody's life that there is that same kind of magic or that those same kinds of themes can be teased out? Or do some people attract a kind of larger story or narrative? You know, Chris Hitchens, the late writer, once... I was at, at a uh, book event with him, and somebody in the audience was talking about they wanted to write a book. Yeah. And Hitchens rather cruelly but perhaps hmm. accurately said, everybody thinks they have a book inside them, and for most people, that's exactly where it should stay. <laughs> 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 so, I, I mean, that's not to devalue anyone's right. story, um, but some stories lend themselves to larger themes and some don't. Uh-huh. But that's interesting. I, you know, I would have expected a different answer from you because I feel like your research is so, you know, you go so deep that you can find connections in anything I, and tell a story out of it. Well, I, I, I think that's true. But I also know I'm looking for the larger themes that can be drawn out of, out of someone's life mm -hmm. and themes that are of interest to me. I know that I could write a newspaper story about just about anybody mm -hmm. and find the points of surprise and interest, but I'm not sure I'd want to devote a whole book to it. Yes. In your new book, which is really about your father and your family and the Red Scare and how he was a, a communist and called before the HUAC committee, one of the things that you mentioned in passing is that he was uncomfortable with the idea of being a journalist. He wanted to be called a newspaper man. He thought of himself <laughs> as a newspaper well, man. Well, just the word journalist he thought was a little bit artificial. And he was old school in yes. that sense. You know, he didn't like the word media either. Huh. He had a preference, sort of like H.L. Mencken or Orwell, of finding the simplest, most accurate way of describing somebody without gussing it up. Mm -hmm. It's clear in reading the book that there are certain values that you can articulate as a journalist that you inherited from your father or that you learned from your father certain kind of techniques or approach to looking at the world and the work that you do. One of them seemed to be to, to question assumptions. Yep. I learned most of the basic, my basic philosophy from my parents and mm. my dad, not fall for any rigid ideology. And that was a lesson that he went through. Mm. Search for the truth wherever it takes you. He was a very forgiving person. And so one of his one of the things he'd say is hate racism, not the racist, which is hard to do sometimes, especially uh, a certain racist president we have right now. I think you can hate him for other reasons hmm. as well. That message that you got from your father, you know, to um, hate the racism, not the racist, to uh, challenge your assumptions, uh, I find to be incredible because you treat the men who called your father to the HUAC committee, you treat them with the same kind of dignity that you treat w those who we would consider to be maybe the heroes of the book. I mean, you treat everybody with the same humanity. Yeah, well, I try to give every human being their humanity. And my feeling, I've never wanted to preach to the choir. I've always wanted to get people to see something larger in the human struggle through characters. But I also and more interested in the way that power shapes our lives than in the way individuals do. And people in power have a different responsibility than, than the average citizen. So in this book, there's a, there's a woman, Berenice Baldwin, who was an informant for the FBI for nine years, who came in from the cold to testify at the hearings in 1952 in Detroit, where my father was named and where our lives were changed forever. And she was a paid informant, but who was paying her and why and who was using her and why? Mm -hmm. And so I, I say in the book, 
you know, I, as much as I tried, I couldn't raise much animosity towards her. Mm-hmm. Um, but Chairman John Stevens Wood, the chairman of the House on American Activities Committee, who had been a member of the Klan as a young man, who had unbelievably driven the car that carried the lynched body of Leo Frank to the mortuary after his lynching in 1915, you know, this Jewish industrialist in Atlanta, John Stevens Wood, who'd voted against or for every segregated Mm -hmm. action in Congress and against every civil liberties action. I have less humanity. I mean, I give him less than Mm -hmm. I would Berenice Baldwin, although I still try to portray him in three dimensions. You do, and I wonder if something, an example of something that emerges in research that you know you mention a few times in the book, somewhat happily, although I don't see it as being smug, is that you discovered that he had this Native American blood oh. and that his wife could never <laughs> really forgive him for it because she was maybe even a bigger racist than he was. Yeah, his, his wife was um, a member of the illustrious Jones family in Georgia. Bobby Jones, the famous golfer, mm-hmm. was was related to her. And she discovered that J- that John Stevens Wood was half Cherokee after they were married. And according to her grand- to their grandson, who's quoted in the book, uh, she never forgave uh, Wood for that. So even the, the member of the House Un-American Activities Committee who was calling my father un-American, yes. my father, who'd been the commander of an all-black unit in World War II, being called un-American by... Uh, this Southern racist. Even he wasn't American enough for his own wife. Yes. I know. it. So there it is. There, there. Yeah. Th- did you have any idea of that before the research? No. no you found that. Yeah. So what, what is it like in your research when you find something like that? What happens in that process? It's one of the most uh, rewarding. I mean, usually I'll come home and tell my wife, Linda, a gold mine. You know, that's, that's sort of my, my line for anything like that. It happens innumerable times in every book. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the thrill of the chase, of the yes. research to, to come across. It's always there, but I don't know what it'll be. Yes. Um, but in every book, I found things that I never imagined that I would find. You also, in every book, take yourself to the physical space that you're writing about. You put yourself in that place. My motto is go there, <laughs> uh, wherever there is. Uh, so for Lombardi, it meant uttering the famous <laughs> immortal words to my wife, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? Mm-hmm. It was a little easier to get her to go to Rome for my Rome 1960 book about the Olympics or Puerto Rico for the Clemente book. Or Vietnam. Uh, or Vietnam, which was a fabulous experience for the Vietnam book. But yeah, that's that's the way. I, I really believe that every human being is shaped by the geography, the cultural, sociological, and physical geography of where they're from. In this and case, so, you went to Spain also. My uncle, Bob Cummins, my mother's older brother, who, like my mother and father, went to the University of Michigan, was one of three Michigan students in 1937, after he, just after he graduated, who uh, went to New York, took a ship across the Atlantic to France, a train across France, and climbed over the Pyrenees Mountains to fight in the Spanish Civil War against the fascists, against Francisco Franco, and uh, Hitler and Mussolini, who are uh, assisting Franco. And it's a very important part of the book because it really shaped the ideology of my mother and of many young people of that era. The Spanish Civil War, I consider one of the great underappreciated historical events of the 20th century. All of the isms of the 20th century were at play there. Yes, I've been thinking about the Spanish Civil War for a long time. Spain is very close yes. to my heart and uh, had never seen that kind of firsthand account of what it was like for the Americans who went there. When I was in high school, there was a there was a, somebody in Madison who had been in yes. the what we, we call the Lincoln Brigade. I learned is actually not a... Not a brigade. Not a brigade. Yeah. Yeah. But in reading a about the American experience in your book, something occurred to me that I can't believe had never occurred to me before, which is that it may have ended up being worse for the 20th century if the fascists had lost the war because it had become so pushed, radicalized, and it would have potentially been a Soviet stronghold in Europe. It was a very complicated war. I 
I wouldn't go as far as you in saying it could have been worse. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty bad. It was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. And what Franco did after he won power and or during the war, you know, when he killed Lorca and, yes. and, and hundreds of thousands of Spaniards who were on the left. Um, and just as many were killed in the years after he took power. That's true. Whether the Soviets, whether, whether it would have been a Soviet satellite, I'm not positive about that. Um, but certainly the Soviet influence in that war is something that's difficult but important to grasp. Yes. And I think that you see it most clearly in Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, um, where he, you know, he, he writes, Orwell was on the left and wrote very clearly and honestly about the uh, contradictions of that. And matter of fact, there, yeah. in the middle of the war, there was a fight in Barcelona between the anarchists and the communists, yes. you know, and, and Orwell was caught up in that. He could have been killed yes. by the communists during yes. that period. So, you know, history is always more complicated than, than the politics of any moment allow it to be. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the roles of a historian is to write the as closely as you can the uh, subtleties, nuances, contradictions of any period of history. And that certainly was true in the Spanish Civil War. I say that without in any way uh, not honoring those Americans who went over there to fight. They were idealists. And they, they thought they were fighting, and they were fighting against fascism, which was the real scourge of the 20th century, and were naive about the Soviet Union. Yes. Some of them. So, and some of them not. I mean, some of, some them, of them were, were totally into it. Were yeah. totally into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that in honoring the subtlety and the nuance and the complexity of history, it has an effect on the way you see the present in your life? I mean, do you have to work to shut off whatever your own feelings are about certain things in order to represent history honestly or, or in that balanced way? As a writer... I've always been more interested in explaining why things are the way they are and why they're happening than in making ideological points. As a human being, I'm as ideological mm -hmm. and as political <laughs> and as biased in what I think is right as any other person. And, you know, I think that a lot of American politics is within a, a or used to be within a definable range of disagreement. Mm -hmm. And when it goes beyond that into pure racism and authoritarianism, then I don't feel any compulsion to rein in my feelings about that, because mm -hmm. I think those go beyond the, the norm of American democracy. And I think we're right there right now. Well, that you say it used to be within a definable range. Right. That suggests that we're maybe not there. Anymore. I don't think we're there right now. I really don't, and I think that creates a certain dilemma for for mainstream journalists. But I also still believe that, you know, writing the truth is not like searching for a balance between falsehood and truth. Mm -hmm. It's for searching for the truth. Mm -hmm. And when someone lies, they're lying. Yes, and you can define that. And I think that the Washington Post and New York Times, which have always you know, are considered mainstream and sometimes make mistakes, but they're basically trying to find the truth. And I think, that, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to defend them. Even, you know, this last week when the New York Times had a headline that was wrong, mm -hmm. I'm not going to cancel my subscription over that because nine times out of 10, they're, they in the post are providing information that wouldn't come out otherwise. Part of the reason this is relevant to your story is that you've also been at the Washington Post for m the majority of your career. Right. And you're the son of a newspaperman and an right. editor. Yep. This is near and dear to your heart. And in fact, I think it speaks to a larger question that we're going through right now, which has to do with a kind of a general disagreement in the country about what the facts are and what the truth is and who you trust when it comes to information. There's a large part of the country that doesn't trust what they read in traditionally reliable journalistic sources. You're absolutely right. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One is the dissolution of institutions in American life. Mm. Hmm. One is the rise of talk radio and Fox News 
and in propounding a alternate version of facts, um, which was not there before. But there's also, you know, there's pluses and minuses to everything. I mean, the explosion of different sources of information mm-hmm. can lead to positive things in terms of breaking down just sort of a hierarchical mode of of what the truth is mm-hmm. and f- looking for other sources and more diverse sources. But it also can lead to um, a lot of misinformation and uh, manipulation of information. So like all technological changes, it comes with good and bad. And we, we're still adjusting to all of this. And I don't think, I don't think that America has figured it out yet. And I don't know what, how it will, how it will, how it will change. But it's it's in the process. It's in a transformational process. I think right now, and like a lot of things, I think a lot of what's going on right now politically is because of that uncertainty and transformation, hmm. and a and a sort of a retrograde action by people who feel threatened by diversity, threatened by the new world. They make the present iffy, but I think the future is more promising. Mm. Um, But I think that we're going through that struggle right now. It's interesting to hear you say the present iffy and the future more promising, because there is a sense I have from you that despite all of it, and you have more information than most of us, you seem to essentially be optimistic. Well, I am an optimist. I did inherit that from my father, who survived a lot more difficult events than I did have. My optimism has been challenged more in the last few years than than ever. I'm not, I haven't given up, and I do believe that if we get through this Trump era, there'll be some damage that'll be hard to overcome. There's one huge thing that we haven't dealt with, which is climate change, mm-hmm. which I don't know whether we'll be able to overcome that one. But just in terms of of demographics and the younger generation, um, I feel more optimistic than pessimistic about the future. And yet you set that phrase up as if we get through this Trump era. Right. What because, you, what you mean I mean, that? we're dealing with an authoritarian who, who is uh, manipulating the process in a lot of dangerous ways. See, and what... e- even the 2020 election, I, you know, I optimistically believe that Trump's a goner, but with the help of Russia and with... And even if he loses, whether it will be a peaceful transition or not, Mm. I'm not sure. I tend to agree with you, which even three years ago would have seemed crazy. Oh, totally. See, I was an optimist in believing in the basic, for all of its real serious flaws, I believed in American democracy and that it would prevail. And now I'm not as sure because of this. Well, that really speaks to how severe this situation is because you have been exploring all of the uh, ways in which the American experience lived up to its promise and also didn't. I mean, in so many projects and to now at this stage, including your, your, this, you know, your most recent book, which definitely explores going back hundreds of years your father and his cohort who were brought before the committee essentially said, look, we are American and it is American to challenge injustice, to try to make the mm-hmm. country better. This does mm-hmm. not make us un-American. Right. It's a lot like the squad today being called un-American and essentially saying, no, no, we are American to challenge injustice in the country. But for you, despite everything that you've seen to say this moment is different, it does seem like a significant thing to say. Well, I don't think we've ever had a president like Trump. I think we've had in my lifetime presidents that I've disagreed strongly with their policies, but I never felt that they were more interested in only themselves and not their vision of the future and of the country. And I I think Trump is only interested in himself. And for various short-sighted and incredibly crass reasons, the Republican Party has allowed this to happen. Yes. And so I blame them. I mean, Trump is Trump. The Republican Party is dissolved essentially and is now the Trump party and for them to allow this to happen is inexcusable and depressing and 
I don't know what's going to happen with the party after this. And given all of that, what does it mean to you as a journalist, and what does it mean to the Fourth Estate in general? What is the role changed? Is the responsibility changed given these new conditions? The central role is the same, which is to do our job, to search for the truth, to um, challenge power, and to find the story wherever it is and write it well and accurately and powerfully. But the circumstances have definitely changed. And when you have a president like Trump, it's really difficult, but more important than ever. And in some ways, it's the most clear example of why just presenting two sides of a story is not enough. Mm -hmm. That searching for the truth is the key. Framing the story that way, yes, as right. opposed to saying we talked to these two people, right. they told us different exactly. stories. I see you in the book trying, despite everything, to square the fact that your father was a communist. I mean, you say it early in the book and then later in the book also that maybe he was seduced by something. And maybe there was some effect of your, your mother, who was also very, and to some degree, maybe even more ideological than your father. Yeah. Why was it important for you? to ask that question, you know, and, and try to explain why he was a communist. I say early in the book that I say that with a, without pride or shame, yes. just as a fact. Yes. And I don't have any question about why he was attracted to the Communist Party. Yeah. When you study American history and see the, the era in which he rose with, you know, the Depression— and serious questions about what was capitalism doing to this country um, with the role of race in American life and the fact that the Communist Party was very progressive and outspoken in defending African Americans when very few others were, and the rise of fascism and, and Nazism and the central role that, I mean, America didn't win World War II. The Soviet Union more, mm. even more did. So when you combine all that, you can understand it. But what I was interested in is why was he blind to some of the signals that the Soviet Union was also an autocracy yeah. and repressive and murderous? Mm -hmm. And that's more of a question of human nature than it is of politics. Mm -hmm. People believe what they want to believe, especially when they think they're on the right side. Yes. And why did it take longer for my dad than some other people to see that? Um, is it... I think a legitimate question. He did see it. He did. He, both of my parents um, learned from that experience, and were ostracized to some degree uh, by by their beliefs in an un-American way. But nonetheless, I'm I'm curious about what it was that propelled them not to join the Communist Party, but to stay in it after some of the more obvious signs of the Soviet Union's intents. This book is about so many things, and it's not only about your father, but if if the elevator pitch was, well, it's my father, and this is what happened to my father, and this is you know the journey that my family went on after he had to, he was named, and yeah. your mother is a huge part of that story. Yeah, I think she is. And it was a balance for me uh, in writing the book. Um, see, my mother was not called before the committee. That's the central yes. uh drama of the book. And so that's my dad. Yes. But it's our whole family and my mother's influence on my father and her sort of ability to keep our family together during that very traumatic period. The ideology that arose from the Cummins side of the family. My mother was a Cummins. My uncle Bob, who fought in the Spanish Civil War, was such a central part of that ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and then another aspect, a smaller aspect of the book is sort of the role of depression, physical depression in our family. And, and tragedy to and an tragedy. extent. Yes. Yeah, my, my, my mother's other brother had a breakdown and had a lobotomy or mm. some kind of a operation on his brain. And my mother dealing with that um, and sort of the, the more melancholy side of our family comes from the, that. And my mother's very astute in her letters to her, her brother, Phil, my uncle Phil, who had the mental breakdown, and sort of dealing with uh, melancholy and depression. Your uncle Phil, who was depressed and had mental illness, 
if it weren't for his kind of estrangement from the family because he lived in a sanitarium, is what right, they called it, in Asheville, yeah. they had to write him all the news. And so you've got these documents at every major life event. Yes. Letters have always been an important part of my research. From the time that I was in Hope, Arkansas, and staying at a rundown motel on the edge of town, and it turned out that the night clerk was Billy Clinton's great aunt. Mm -hmm. And she took me home because she felt sorry for me because I have allergies, and she said she had a magic potion, and we went to her house, and she gave me this potion. It turned out it made me sicker, but she had a box of letters from Bill Clinton to his mama, his mm -hmm. grandmother. That was my first book. And ever <laughs> since, in every book, I've searched for that sort of document as a way of rooting myself in the moment. Letters aren't necessarily always completely accurate, but they're an accurate presentation of a time that you can't recreate. Yes. So what happens in the future? I mean, we've kind of passed the age of letters now. Boy, I mean, I don't, you know, what is it going to be? Instagram yeah. I mean, we're, we're, or Snapchat, which disappears, right? I mean, I'm not on Snapchat, but email is almost passe. Well, at least the email is a one-to-one -one, like a letter. Yeah. I mean, the thing about it, it actually raises a really interesting question because, of course, we even in a letter, we can choose to represent more or less what we want to represent about yes. how we're feeling. There's an assumption of a certain kind of uh, honesty, but it, you, you could obviously misrepresent things if you want, but not to the extent that we do in social media in which it's a public face that we're presenting. It's not the same thing. No, it's not at all. You're absolutely right. And I don't know what that means for future historians. Yes. Barack Obama's library and archive is going to be online. It's yes. They're not going to have the real documents there. I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I understand that that makes it more accessible, but it also makes it harder for... I can't tell you how many times I've held a letter mm -hmm. and felt it in a way that I can never feel from from a representation of it online. I mean, there's an enormous conceit in your book that is specific to oh. looking at the way your father typed something and what happened in his head when he had to type an S in a certain way and go over it twice. Well, that was, it was actually more in my head than in his, but it was the statement that he wrote, uh, he wanted to deliver to the committee, which they would not allow him to read. And I thought it was lost history until I found it in the archives at the National Archives in Washington. My dad was a classic hunt and peck newspaper typist who was constantly Xing things out. And his copy was messy, but his writing was great. Mm -hmm. But the first S in statement from Elliot Marinus, the S jumped up a half space the way, you know, if you're typing on an old manual typewriter, you know, the keys could stick and it'd go like, and it was when I saw that, that I, for the first time in my life, really started to feel what my father must have been feeling at that moment mm -hmm. when he was writing out that statement in the most, in the crucible of, of that challenge to his everything. So... Yeah, it was reading, looking at that, the physicality of that statement, that it had a profound emotional effect on yes, me. Yes, that pr maybe would not be there if it were in an email. I don't think it would. Yeah. yeah definitely not. I'm not a troglodyte. I'm not <laughs> particularly adept at all the new media, but I, I've always maintained when people ask me about the future of my professions mm -hmm. that platforms always change. Yes. I mean, you've experienced that from the from your father to you in yes. terms of how you do music. That's right. But what can't change in my profession is the need for humans to understand themselves through story. Yes. And the need for people to actually go out and find the real story. Yes. And not just do it in their bedrooms. You know, you describe holding this thing, looking at the letter, seeing this S and the way it jumped and and somehow being transported for a moment into what maybe your father was feeling. Interestingly, you also say in the book that when you started to get into the book, it was your brother, who's older and has a slightly different memory and experience of this aspect of your family's life, who said to you, how could you expect ever to know what our parents were thinking? Yeah, my older brother Jim and I have a 
interesting relationship. I love him deeply. There's no uh, schism between us at all. But he was six going on seven when my dad was called before the committee. He remembers it. He endured that period in a way that I didn't because I wasn't conscious. I was two, just about three. I don't remember it. Um, I remember us moving around for five years, but not in a traumatic way. It was just, I was a little kid and you'd go where your family goes. Yes. And my brother, you know, going to three schools in one semester, things like that had a had a more profound psychological effect on him. And so to some degree, I think he felt it was more his story than mine, um, which I understand. In some ways, I think he was being protective of my father's, what he thought were my father's wishes not to tell that story. Yes. Um, and I think he underestimated, hmm. I don't know why. Well, this is what I thought. It's interesting but he underestimated that he would... my ability to find things. Yeah, I mean, this isn't your first time doing no, this. No, it's not. So for all of those reasons, I thought he was trying to talk me out of doing the book. Yeah. He would now say that he wasn't. He now is, feels honored by the book and yeah. glad that I did it. But I had to overcome his questioning of my ability to do this, you know, without being artificial about it, I'm glad he challenged me mm-hmm. because it made me really think about, well, why am I doing this book? And and when I came to the realization I'm doing it because I believe in the search for truth and I want to understand my family and myself, and this is the way to do it, and I'm not dishonoring my father, but honoring him by doing it. Yes. You know, Jim challenged me to, to reach those conclusions that propelled me through the book. But it's interesting at this stage in your career that that would come up and challenge you because you've obviously had to confront that question over and over again. Can I ever know what anybody was thinking? And at every time I'm starting a book, I have that same queasy feeling about can I really get it? Yes. But that pushes me to get it. I wonder, though what the process would have been like if you had a memory of it. I think it was important that I didn't really remember uh-huh. it. You know, in different ways, I've gone through that in different books. Um, with President, with Bill Clinton, he wouldn't talk to me after I started the book. Hmm. And I tried to get many interviews with him. And in the end, I felt that was good. I'm glad he didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it forced me to find, not deal with his rationalizations, but just go for the truth on its own and treat him like he wasn't around. Yes. Even though he was president of the United States, it was important for me as an historian to not be affected by the moment, but look for uh, something that goes beyond the moment. And so in this case, I would have written a different book if I remembered it more. It might have been more appealing in some ways in terms of a personal journey, but it wasn't the book that I wanted to write. And I think you see enough of me in the book uh, and how my sensibility was shaped by these events and my also sort of discovery process through this, which if I already had formed opinions, I wouldn't have had that same discovery. Yes. So it's probably too broad a question to really answer succinctly, but what did you learn about yourself and what effect has it had on you? I learned more deeply about race. You know, reading my father's letters from the war, I've always had a strong feeling about racial injustice. My son does. Mm -hmm. It's deeply ingrained in my family. And I see where it came from, Mm -hmm. from my father uh, in that period. And my mother, you know, in World War II was a Rosie the Riveter Mm -hmm. and defending the African Americans who were hired in Detroit Mm -hmm. uh, at a time when there were race riots. So I see that. I see my love of writing. There's one letter my dad wrote way before I was born describing how it was in his blood and he just loved to do it. And that's a phrase I've always used. Hmm. So I definitely see that love of writing through that. And my wariness of rigid ideologies comes through my parents' experiences, um, which I didn't fully appreciate before you know, undertaking this book. So did you get the sense when you were growing up that they were very careful about rigid ideologies. And in researching this, you realize that they learned it firsthand, the danger of it. Yeah. And and they were always very progressive yeah. liberals. During a, my teenage and early adulthood, it was during the 60s and, you know, it was the, the new left. Yes. And my father wasn't dismissive of the new left, but he was always trying to, to tell some of those young radicals, be cognizant yes. of being blinded. Yes. And that affected me too. 
I was always aware of of not going too far to the point of belief where you become blinded by reality. Yes. And I think that came through that my father's experiences there. There's one really difficult part of my father's life that I don't write about in the book. I didn't because it would have taken up too much. Hmm. It was too deep. But, you know, he was very strong member of the newspaper guild. He uh, f- helped found the guild in, in Detroit and defended it and worked for a strike newspaper in Iowa before he coming to Madison. And the guild didn't defend him. You know, just like my uncle had some yes. uh, realizations about uh, the working class. When my father was fired, the guild was on this anti-communist crusade and they didn't defend him. And he survived it, gets all the way, rises in mm-hmm. Madison, all the way to become the editor, and the guild goes on strike against the Capital Times. Mm. I was in Washington then. It was a very difficult period for me to watch from afar. Most of the people who went on strike, it wasn't against the Capital Times per se, but, but they felt an animosity towards anybody who was crossing the picket line. My dad had to. He was the editor of the paper. And it was really heartbreaking for me to watch that whole period. And most of the people who went on strike, my father hired back. They, uh, I don't know, I don't don't even want to talk about it too much. But anyway, that's sort of one of those great ironies of life that came late in his career. That is so interesting because, in fact, when he's called before the the committee, he makes a point. I mean, they're given give him very little leeway to say right. anything. Yeah. And the one thing that he really insists on saying is these are the bylaws of, of my the, guild. Exactly. But again, he got, th- you know, my father was a survivor. Yeah. He got through worse things yeah. earlier in his life. He got through that and he got through it amazingly with his optimism intact. Yes. So that many of the people who went on strike against the Capital Times, who are my friends, yeah, came back either to the paper or to understanding my father's situation and not, and he not holding it against them. Mm. I was thinking about in this book, there's a structural setup in which you yeah. reach into the past for a chapter, then we're back to the uh, committee hearing in 1952, then we're back in the past, and it gives you an opportunity to fill in and then tell a single story. That was very important to this book. The structure was the key, in my opinion, along with finding the right voice. And the structure basically is, for first 12 chapters, it's A, B, A, B, A, B. Yeah. And then from then on, it's chronological. But the reason I had to do it that way is because I knew I couldn't wait chronologically until near the end of the book to introduce the trauma of that hearing. Yes. I didn't want to give it huh. all away, but I wanted people to know right away what was going on. Yes. And then have them see all of the characters and themes that would define the book in those 12 chapters so that by the time you get to chapter 13, you're ready for, for it to just flow because you know what the basic uh, right. Struggles are. So did you research into that structure? Did you have the structure? I didn't have the structure. So what I do is I'll I'll research for a couple of years, and then I'll stop and spend about two or three months just organizing my material. So when you're researching... When you're researching... When I'm researching, I do organize while I'm researching in terms of I have three ring binders full of different chronologies and different aspects of the book. And then I'll take all of that material and condense it into what I think will probably really be part of the book. And that takes a couple of months. Mm. And it's during that process that I'm thinking about the structure. When I started writing this book, I I didn't know there'd be 12 chapters and then Mm -hmm. the rest of the book, but I knew that I had to use this style of back and forth Mm -hmm. to get the reader both knowing what the story's going to be and knowing the characters. Mm -hmm. There's also these wonderful, I mean, I think they're more than tricks, but how to end a chapter, to to end a chapter with some revelation that's just juicy enough that yeah, makes you want to read I, the next chapter. You right. Know? That's, that, that is a trick. I mean, but it's also, I mean, the, the chapter of my Uncle Bob in Spain. Yes. Sets, that, that's my favorite ending of the whole book. 
this is the chapter that ends with your parents meeting. Yes. This is, and this that is, is how my parents, my parents this met. This is how my parents yeah, met. I mean, exactly. you know, I mean, that's like it's like curtain closer, razor, everything right there. Yeah. Right. No, I think I actually have a note in that, at that <laughs> one where I say, boy, he knows how to end a chapter. <laughs> but so are you writing towards that? I mean, as you write the chapter, you know that that's where you're, we're going to land with my parents yeah. meeting yeah. here. Yeah. I often, in that one page outline I have, sometimes I'll, and even a book or a chapter before I thought I was going to, because I come across an ending that I don't want to go past. Yes. But usually in that one page outline, I have where I want to start it and where I want to end it, and maybe four or five of the key mm -hmm. hinges of that chapter, and that's it. And so for that chapter, I. You know. I know. What is the feeling of finishing and delivering one of these things like? Well, finishing is emotional. There's always, that's a fabulous feeling of accomplishment. And and in this case, it was even more uh, emotional. I mean, there are a couple of times where I've teared up. Mm -hmm. And this was one of those books, finishing it. Then there's this period of, what, what, what do you call it, postpartum blues or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're waiting f for it to come out. It takes several months and, you know, you're worried about the reviews and all that. I hate that period. <laughs> And then you see the to see the book physically is another thrill. Mm -hmm. And then I actually enjoy most of the process of promoting a book because it gives me the opportunity to, to talk about it. And I feel if I can talk about it, people will buy it or understand it. You know, some interviews the the uh, interviewer hasn't even looked at the book. Look, you know, they maybe have looked at a press release. Hmm. And that's more often the case on television than anywhere else, except for Brian Lamb and C-SPAN and you know mm -hmm. things like that. It's always a crapshoot in terms of public appearances. You know, like in Madison at the public library, they people were turned away. There was such a huge crowd. Sure. You know? My friend Rick Atkins and I talk about the Mendoza line of of appearances where. If it's 13 people or less, you're under the Mendoza line. <laughs> Anything beyond that is fine. You know, I, I, ranging from 13 to 1,000. You know, you are a commercially successful writer. You've appeared on television. You're known. And also, in order to promote and sell a book, it, it often means that you find yourself, I'm sure that you have generally more than 13 people in a room, but that you walk into bookstores and you read and yeah. you have to go down. It's yeah. like in the yeah. trenches of, yeah, no, of the book is. business. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't had any of those really embarrassing yeah. moments, you know, in the last several books, but yeah. I've gone through it. Yeah. I think John Grisham in his first book had two people show up at the bookstore. You know, I'm not in his yeah. uh, class in terms of book sales, but I mean, I have to, same as a musician, you have to say, however many people are there, I have to give them the same yes. story, the same quality. Yes. So I try to do that. But you never, I never know. And there's always a little bit of anxiety, queasy stomach, who's going to show up, you right. know, what's it going to be like. What, what are they going to say? Yeah. What is the thought of another book after, or another long project like after finishing this? You're already on to the next one. I am. It's going to be a, a full-scale biography of Jim Thorpe. Uh -huh. And it's my chance to write about the Native American experience through his life. I've already had some great breakthroughs, but I'm not quite there yet in terms of full-time obsession. Do you think you can get as obsessed now that you've written the book about your own family? I mean, will there ever be anything that obsesses you in the same way? That's a good question. Uh, I hadn't thought about it. You're probably right. <laughs> um, but I can be obsessed enough. Think. <laughs> that's that's what I do. It's a great story. I already know that. It has a lot of different elements to it. The whole notion of the treatment of American Indians in Thorpe's period, which essentially was the philosophy of kill the Indian, save the man. Mm -hmm. You know, the mythology that he was Blackhawk's great-great-grandson. Mm-hmm. And he was like the greatest athlete. Greatest that... athlete of the, at least the first half of the 20th century. His athletics allow me to go from the Olympics to baseball to football, all three, mm. which is a pretty broad canvas. And All three of which you have explored yeah. individually right. before. Right. You say something in this new book, I mean, it's clear 
if anybody's been following your books, that you alternate. You like to tell sp- sports stories, and then you tell generally often political stories. But you say in the book that there's a tradition in your family that sports became a way of deferring emotional conversation, that people would talk about sports in an effort to stay communicative, stay connected, yes. and not have to say the difficult things. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball in particular in my family it plays a very crucial role in connecting people and in allowing them to survive political and Uh other traumas. You know, Leo, that's an interesting point because that's true, but that's not why I turn to sports. Tell me why. I turn to sports because I think it allows me the opportunity to use a dramatic, inherently dramatic story to illuminate other parts of American history. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for that combination of the arc of drama and sociological significance. Yes. You know, I don't view sports as the funny pages of American life. I, I view it as as relevant. I mean, politics can be trivial, mm-hmm. and sports can be sociologically significant mm-hmm. and vice versa. It depends on what you're looking at and what the issues are. I mean, I think that in terms of uh, race inequality mm-hmm. in America, for African Americans and for women, sports is as relevant and illuminating as anything else. Yes. I think because I don't have this, I don't have a, I'm not compelled to, I've never found a sport that I was into. I didn't grow up in a heavy sports family, you know? So, I mean, I had long conversations with friends growing up about why I felt like the arts and music were the place where you would look to those. Because, I mean, you could tell stories through the arts as well. Oh, totally, yeah. And through music and popular culture. Uh, They're both, I think, totally true. But to an extent, I think, I, I, I do recognize that sports connect and unite people around a cause that even music doesn't always do. Well, I think music does. I don't I don't I It's not an it's music not a, is the most universal language, yes. right? I think. When I would write my sports books, I would send them to a, a family friend, Whitney Gould, who hates sports mm-hmm. and have her read them. Yes. Because you know, even though I don't hate sports, I find professional athletics flawed and college athletics too. Oh, yeah. But I also find stories within them that I think are way past sports, and that's what I'm trying to deal with. You know, I did some music in the Detroit book, Mm -hmm. but I'm not as... And it's not that I have to be an expert in a subject to write about it, and I love exploring things that I don't know, but I I have a natural affinity towards sports, and so if I can use that affinity and develop something larger, then I'll do it. So, and do you keep a list? Is there a long list? Or do you have to kind of go uh, inward to think about a yeah, project? Yeah, I can't do a story that someone else suggests. Huh. I'll, I'll never do that. <laughs> and it at has, this point, I assume editors and publishers know this? and the Editors are, know. Yes. Uh, publishers know this. Yeah. The public doesn't. They're always sending me, <laughs> you should write a book about this and that. And I always politely say, thank you. but it, Because I have to be obsessed with it. Yeah. I often signed two book contracts so mm-hmm. I know what the second book will be mm-hmm. and in this case it actually started with Detroit so it's a three book contract but I don't know what I'm going to write after that um, you knew that this second book was going to be the second in the trilogy well actually the trilogy was the Detroit book yeah it was Detroit Rome and Vietnam ah, right because those are the 60s right and this book doesn't quite fit into a trilogy because it's more personal yeah. but um and this book actually took me out of the 60s for once. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, back to the 50s the, and the 30s. In the 30s, yeah. Took you the which 30s. was really fun. And Thorpe will take me into the 10s. I mm-hmm. mean, his his best sports years were from 1912 to 1922. So, And the Indian story of the Indian schools is from 1880 to 1930. I think that I wrote about the 60s because it was a defining period of my generation. Yes. And I think I exhausted it. I'm yeah. ready to go into different, different yeah. periods. Dave Marinus, thank you for writing about the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, <laughs> the 50s, the 60s, and today, and for the time today. Thanks, Leo. It was great talking with you. There he was, the thoughtful, metaphysical, and highly prolific David Marinus. I've been busy collecting more great conversations this summer. More writers? Yep. Amazing musicians? Also. Record label people, some. A world-renowned neuroscientist, how did you know? 
I'll be back again next time with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.